In the middle of the culture war we find ourselves in, it would be hard to argue that critical theory isn't one of the most contentious areas of discussion. It's a lightning rod that draws both intense criticism as well as unbridled acclaim. So I thought it would be a good idea to examine what it looks like when it's put in practice. People are, in general, familiar with Ibram X. Kendi and Robin DiAngelo. Agree or disagree with them, they're the intellectual face of critical race theory in the world right now. The big names, so to speak but we find little commentary on lesser-known critical race theory adherents, those just as dedicated to the cause, but whose names and efforts go largely unnoticed. In that context, I believe we can take a look at Sharon Toomer. The best place to start would be her mostly defunct opinion news website, blackandbrownnews.com. While Toomer doesn't slap critical race theorist in big bold letters anywhere you can find her, her writing and words shout it. And while I won't read you the whole thing, I will highlight the main example of why I would consider Toomer a critical race theorist from an article published on her website as well as in Perspectives on Health Equity and the Social Detriments of Health, a National Academy of Medicine special publication, December 2017, entitled Urgent Dispatch, Calling on Leadership to Respond to Violence in Black Neighborhoods as a Public Health Crisis. The main example is right near the top of the Urgent Dispatch. Language matters. We use black people to describe the human beings we focus on and we use neighborhood in place of community. From our viewpoint, black people authentically and broadly describes and includes the people we highlight. The alternatives, African American, people of color, minorities, people of African descent, do not resonate with us in style, in content, or in this context. Here, she's not hiding the ball. She's putting it in plain sight. If you said, a black person in America is an African American, her response would be, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And the same goes for people of color, minorities, and people of African descent. As she states, those do not associate with her in style, in content, or in her context. Here, what she's doing is she's redefining what black people means. In the context she is using the term black people, what she is referring to is oppressed people, as Herbert Marcuse would use the term oppressed, which is very much not what the average person will think of when hearing the word oppressed. This is 100% in line with critical race theory. There are plenty of other examples throughout the article that I suggest you read in full. I've provided the link in the description as well as the link to the PDF of the special publication from the National Academy of Medicine that published it. The table of contents is basically fertile grounds for critical race theorists. A quick search led me to an interview done with Sharon Toomer on June 20th, 2018. Since this is a rare appearance of a critical race theorist being asked questions by an interviewer, I thought it'd be worth going through. Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Sharon Toomer, Executive Director of the National Association of Black Journalists. Sharon has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Sharon, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The introduction is legitimizing. The PBS logo attached to the Howard University's TV station logo. The show title design is clear. The interviewer appears to be polite, good-natured, and familiar with his role. This lends credence to the critical race theorist as a person whose opinion we should be interested in, as does her title, Executive Director of the National Association of Black Journalists. That's new too. From being the owner of blackandbrownnews.com, a website that's mostly defunct and poorly designed, along with critical race theory parading as opinion news, to a prestigious position in a long-standing journalistic institution, Talk about the genesis of the Association of Black Journalists. Why was the organization founded uh, all the way back in, I believe it was 1975? 1975, right here in Washington, D.C. 44 uh, journalists in the area, black journalists, uh, formed this organization that uh, oddly, uh, you know, they started for the same purpose that we see we still need 40 plus years later. This is a basic first question. Asking about the organization she's the executive director of, why was it founded, how did it begin, normal stuff. Her answer implies that racism is as bad in America in June of 2018 as it was in 1975, which is patently absurd on its face, but the interviewer doesn't challenge her on it. We need to pause here for a moment to take a quick look at the NABJ. 
The NABJ seems to be an institute that's been corrupted by critical race theory. It appears to have once stood for the ideals it stands for, and to a degree still stands for. However, there's a multitude of examples of critical race theory and critical theory in general throughout the organization, and we'll touch on some of that later. But keep in mind that in 2015, the NABJ gave its award for Journalist of the Year to Nicole Hannah-Jones, and this is well before the 1619 project. Other winners of their Journalist of the Year award seem completely valid, while others include Dean Baquet and Jamel Hill. So well, you form an organization, but how do you have impact? Once you form this organization, how do you actually start to change behaviors and communicate issues to people who might be unconscious that there ever was an issue? First off, notice the framing of the question. How do you actually start to change behaviors and communicate issues to people who might be unconscious that there ever was an issue. To the average person, this is a normal question. How do you advocate for an issue people are unconscious of, and how does that advocacy result in changed behaviors? To a critical race theorist like Toomer, this is a very different question. The question almost could not have been better served up, because critical race theorists are quite fanatical about what they call false consciousness. False consciousness, taken here from the newdiscourses.com entry for false consciousness, covers this well. It's essentially the notion of an oppressor class so powerful that it has convinced those it oppresses that their oppression is in their best interests. This is the thought process behind why Toomer, in her writing, stated that language matters. Well, there are a number of ways. One, um, we've had some successful partnerships with news organizations, uh, with the philanthropic sector, who believe in our mission, believe that it's necessary. And so in these partnerships, there is um, an exchange of ideas, an exchange of uh, how to do things better. So far, this is a fairly good answer from a critical race theorist who's using words with different definitions but isn't stating so out loud in the interview. Thankfully, we have her previous writing handy. To the average person, this is a very reasonable answer to how someone advocating for change has an effect. They form partnerships with large organizations and have an exchange of ideas. There's nothing too threatening about that. It's very generic language that shows the connections her organization has with news organizations and the philanthropic sector. The philanthropic sector who believes in her mission believe that it's necessary. It's couched in a very civil rights movement-like manner. So, who are some of these connections? As you can see, those are some pretty powerful connections who believe in her mission and are willing to have conversations about how to do things better. This is her way of saying, look, this is the power we have access to and can exert influence over. And we also do our part by preparing our journalists, our membership, through professional development, through training. Um, our convention and career fair happens every year. It is the largest journalism um, uh, convention or gathering. And uh, the career fair, you know, people think about a career fair as, oh, okay, we'll just toss out some resumes and see what comes back. These, our partners, these news organizations actually hire from there. So the networking opportunity is, is um, one component of how we bring a diverse, inclusive perspective in newsrooms. This is a further show of a critical race theorist's influence. The NABJ Career Fair gets journalists hired at many of these large organizations, and she's promoting it as something more important than just your average career fair and handing out resumes. They're also fond of giving out awards to members they like, so let's see what Toomer is talking about. So here we've got two journalists that the NABJ is promoting as Emerging Journalists of the Year in 2017. Let's take a quick look at both of them. Here's the first one. And here's the other. All right, so we have an idea of what kind of journalism the NABJ likes to promote, as well as what they're up to three years and change later. While Kendi and D'Angelo are well-known names, Toomer is hard at work putting individuals who promote critical theory in media organizations. 
And then you also provide training. So what kind of career training do you so provide? So throughout the year, so we have the convention and career fair. That's one of our lar that is our largest program. Mm -hmm. Throughout the year, though, we have media institutes. Uh, we have regional conferences. So we're a, a nationwide network. We're based here, but we have uh, chapters and we have regional uh, conferences that gain p that gather people or gather our members for professional development and we work with our partners to do that. So what did you really tell us there? Not much. Uh, they've got a large career fair, they've got media institutes, they've got regional conferences nationwide. It's kind of saying, look how big of an organization we are. What she didn't do was answer the question at all. Complete evasion. There's no reference to what's in the work with their partners, what materials are used in their trainings, nothing. And in terms of, of the scholarships, you also provide scholarships and internships uh, to mm -hmm. college absolutely. students. Absolutely, absolutely. So talk a little bit about that program. So we have a scholarship program, uh, several of them, and oftentimes, let's say the fellowship uh, is a political reporting fellowship or a uh, environmental, um, it depends on the source of it also you know, to help with school, uh, school's expensive. And so how can we help our membership get through, a, you know, their, their education uh, by lessening the burden? Sometimes those scholarships do just that. The question was, tell us about your scholarship and intern programs. What was her answer? Jargon, political reporting fellowship, environmental, and school that costs money, so we'd like to help with the financial burden. We all know what a scholarship and an internship is. This answer has no specifics in it at all, just that there are some kinds of scholarships and financial help. I think it's safe to say what she's referring to is, we help individuals who align with critical theory and critical race theory and get them into political reporting and environmental reporting, and we try to pay for their education too. In terms of the media landscape, the media landscape has changed significantly. There's been sure increasing uh, consolidation Advertising dollars have disappeared, and with that, many publications, um, many uh, radio stations are consolidating. You see the consolidation of television. Mm -hmm. um, how has that shift affected your work? The interviewer's question is one that she can answer directly and honestly as a critical race theorist. Well, we have to adjust uh, to this new arena, and it's not just TV, there's the digital space. Um, we have to prepare our membership for this world. This is where journalism is going. It t you know, I mean, I don't know how else the, the alarm can be sounded. Yes, there will always be broadcasts, whether it's radio, television. Uh, a lot of print publications are not disbanding their print, but they are moving further along. over to digital space. And how can our membership uh, be prepared to work in those environments. So that digital technology, in fact, our um, convention this year is, the theme of it is driving journalism, technology, and trust. So technology is where journalism is going and has been going for quite some time. So we have to be prepared. Our membership has to be prepared for that. Anyone can answer this question from any perspective. Of course, everyone knows that technology is affecting journalism and those changes bring new challenges. At no point in her answer does she give any specifics. She only provides generic answers. We have to adjust. We have to prepare our members. To put this in clearer context, imagine a flunky of Joseph Goebbels being interviewed on the challenges of the technologically changing media landscape and how the National Socialists plan to deal with it, and you get a clearer idea of what Toomer is trying to say without saying it. Do you think that black journalists have a different, um, different story priorities and different, a different editorial? The interviewer is asking a very pertinent question. Let's see how she answers it. I, <coughs> than, than other journalists do? Um, one, I am a journalist. That's where my uh, heart is. But I've been in the in nonprofit, and I've I've had a foot in many worlds. And this is what I'll say about 
uh, my view of, of journalists and black journalists. One, you're called to the profession uh, because it's, it's not, so, you know, you're not going to, very few of us uh, make big bucks in this. So this is a calling, like education is a calling, right? Uh, we go in there wanting to tell the story, wanting to, to tell the history of, of the world in a different medium, right? And of course, we have an added value to wherever we show up with a lens that most don't have. And so, to me, it just, uh, if I were in a newsroom or leading a newsroom, and I had the benefit of so much uh, value coming to this organization. I would do a lot to make sure, one, we keep them, and two, um, that we assign them to stories that are not just uh, focused on a, a narrow lens, but, you know, we can, we, view the, we can view the environment differently. We can view, we can view um, or bring a perspective about the environment, foreign affairs, um, uh, politics, that our counterparts just may not see. This is a near completely honest and accurate answer. Except, unfortunately, we do have Toomer's writing to contend with. Language matters and her openly stating her redefinition of black people. The interviewer is completely ignorant of this and is taking her answer to be about African Americans or people of color or a minority or even people of African descent. As her writing said, those don't resonate with her in tone, style, or context. What Toomer is talking about is black people in her own critical race theory definition. She's fully aware that the interviewer doesn't know this, nor does she want him to. That way, she can pass off her hate ideology without the kind of attention it deserves. Rather, she comes off as someone who cares deeply for civil rights, unquestioningly. Other than that, it's all quite honest and accurate. Of course, that's if you're interested in the lens and perspective of the modern American equivalent to National Socialism on the environment, politics, and foreign affairs. Note as well how she focused on keeping people with her views in newsrooms and including them. Toomer is playing on, hey, don't just hire black people and assign them good stories. This is part of Toomer's role as a critical theorist. Get their members in positions of power in the media who will help spread their message. We've seen some examples of what that looks like already. Why is it important that I, that I understand and be exposed to your perspective? I always answer that question with, why wouldn't you want to be, you know? But um, no, let's, so, let, but let's that, let, I'm going to start there, I'll the start there, but then let's, let's. Because I, I mean, okay. of course I agree, of course with, you agree, I agree I know. with you. So what just happened there? The interviewer asked a very basic question to dig for a little bit more. Her initial answer is so blatantly self-serving bullshit that the interviewer can't help but jump back in and they talk over each other for a moment before the interviewer is compelled to say, of course I agree with you. This is because of the awkwardness of the question due to it being about race. The interviewer is so concerned with his basic, simple, softball question being potentially misconstrued as not being interested in her opinion due to her race that he fumbles to correct himself. It's a completely ridiculous idea, but the interviewer's rush to clarification in that manner comes off as beyond eagerly apologetic. But that's really the first thing. Why wouldn't anybody want to know a, a diverse perspective? But um, I don't need, you know, this is not, I'm not coining this, but obviously you walk out any door in the United, in the United States and you will see a very different um, landscape. Uh, and one majority group can't possibly capture all the dynamics of that. And that's the, um, the editorial side. The business side, it just makes sense. You know, who's watching you, meaning who's turning on your station um, to, to watch your reporting or to read your, your, your digital platform. Let's pause it here for a moment. Her point is, essentially, there's always more room for diverse perspectives in America, and the perspective of her group can be very useful. Of course, she's not actually referring to African Americans or minorities or anything like that. She's referring to her terminology for black people, meaning oppressed people, in the sense Herbert Marcuse used it. 
When she talks about the business side, she's saying, hey, pay attention to who's watching your stuff and what they want. We can tell you what they want. Again, this is a critical race theorist advocating for critical race theory, but not openly stating it. What she's saying is essentially, hey, racism and bigotry sells. I represent the people it sells to, and I can tell you who to hire, who will give you the most bang for your buck so you're safe from the outrage mobs when you act in a racist manner. Um, so the more diverse and inclusive, because there's, there's a jump sometimes, you know, you can bring in the diversity, but if you're not including them, then it's, you know, what's the point, right? So one doesn't happen without the other. Diversity and inclusivity. What she's saying here is being presented to the average person as don't hire someone just because of their skin color. That'd be tokenism. You have to include them too. But what she means is hire more critical race theorists and include them. It's analogous to saying hire a national socialist to be your new reporter. Well, maybe also your perspective will illuminate my own, right? We all get a little hidebound in our thinking. And to get knocked off of that pedestal, we have to get out of our heads. And we have to see ourselves and, our, and the world from a different perspective. I concur. The interviewer, who appears utterly oblivious, falls back to a very liberal position of a benefit that can be gained by seeing a new perspective. Who knows, even the ever-elusive progress might come from a new perspective. Of course, he's saying this to a critical race theorist. That was the easiest answer in the interview for her. 100% agreement, she concurs. Of course, she's the one with the hate ideology to peddle, so that question is a win for her. Someone very profoundly once said, many years ago, that if fascism ever comes to America, it'll come in the name of, li of liberalism. And what is fascism? Fascism is private ownership, private enterprise, but total government control and regulation. Well, isn't this the liberal philosophy? The conservative, so-called, is the one that says, less government, get off my back, get out of my pocket, and let me have more control of my own destiny. Anyways, back to it. And, and, and maybe the, the, the real value here is that by getting outside of our heads, we can actually become innovative. We can become more entrepreneurial. We can, we can see things that we hadn't seen. We can, we can be exposed to joys that we hadn't been exposed to before mm -hmm. just, just by having that interaction. I think that the, that, that, that the real um, question is if there are systemic issues yeah. with, with ensuring that different perspectives are covered, what do we do about it? And that's really <coughs> the, the, uh, the purpose of the National Association of Black Journalists. When a group of journalists saw an issue, mm -hmm. saw, saw an issue that prevented the exposure of us all to a different perspective, right. you just sort of get together and you start to, become, to advocate for, for those barriers to come down. So, to me, what Reagan said seems to be described in action with the interviewer's comments right now. He's clearly a liberal, he clearly has no clue what he's talking about, and advocating for barriers to come down when speaking with someone whose hate ideology actually requires totalitarian control, further legitimizing her and her cause by extension. It takes, um, and we have good relationships um, where there's a openness. So we, did, we, we miss the mark, meaning, you know, our, a news organization might miss the mark on something. Uh, those who have a relationship with, or a partnership with NABJ and actually tap into the way, into to sources within the organization mm -hmm. who can actually lead them to that ideal right, realizing the ideal in terms of diversity and inclusion. Again, her response here is almost devoid of information. They have relationships where there's openness, and if they have such a relationship, they can use the NABJ's resources. You know, taking the journalists the NABJ gets internships for, fellowships for, who they get scholarships for, and hiring them, then going to them for input on how they cover their stories, and by doing that, well, they're really just realizing diversity and inclusion. And if they don't realize that diversity and inclusion well enough, well, the NABJ has that covered for them too. If this is starting to look like a racket to you, that's because it is. 
Critical race theorists get away with it by using black people as a shield to withstand any criticism. The interviewer clearly is almost totally unaware of who he's talking to and what the subject is in his desire to aid in realizing diversity and inclusion, so to speak. As an interviewer, he managed to get almost no specific details from Toomer in any tangible way. I think it's sometimes there's a, um, a tendency to think, you know, that we can do it all. We can, we can work this out ourselves. When you have a bank of resources and people and expertise who can actually help you along that path of truly reaching a diverse and inclusive and equitable environment. Equity. That's new in this conversation. As is her pointing out that the news organizations need to let go of that, we can do it all. We can work this out ourselves aspect of what a critical race theorist would term whiteness. Not when they have a bank of resources and people and expertise who can actually help you along the path of truly reaching a diverse and inclusive and equitable environment. Even if that bank of experts has its own hate ideology just as bad as many of the worst ideologies of the 20th century. In the next decade, mm -hmm. how do you see the future developing for black journalists? Very good question. Um, I would like to see black journalists at the forefront of every possible, uh, covering every possible aspect of a democracy. You know, I keep pointing to the economics, the politics, the social, the cultural, um, the environmental, all of this which keeps this democracy up. I would like to see us more represented and I would like to see black journalists uh, far more prepared to meet the demands of this new environment, this just new journalism landscape. And it changes. I mean, it's always evolving. So, you know, we're talking about the digital space. We don't know what's going to cut, you know, what, what in the digital space is going to change in the next six months. We just don't know. So we need our membership prepared for those positions. Unsurprisingly, the critical race theorist wants their members at the forefront of all aspects of journalism with their unique hate ideology lens available. And the modern jargon for making sure their members are prepared for the media upheaval that's occurring why, that's just practical sense for a modern professional in the media, certainly. Our members are just waiting to give you advice on how to be on the mark in your news stories. Take advantage of them. And that partnership with organizations like Howard University and Absolutely. other schools that provide education in journalism yes. and organizations that can provide internships to young people and initial starting jobs and that training. That's right. All of that is part of... of of that picture. And it's not only um, the journalism landscape, it's also the media landscape. And so you have media outlets um, like Facebook, like Twitter, uh, uh, Apple, Google, those are media companies. And our journalists can also be prepared for, position in, for, for um, positions in those environments. And here, Tumor reminds us, it's not just the news organizations her members are prepared for as well. It's companies like Facebook, Twitter, Apple, and Google too. Their activists are ready for positions to help with things like controlling algorithms or letting you know who is and who isn't allowed on those platforms. Coincidentally, they're all left-leaning and equally coincidentally, they're all rather radical in their beliefs. So, so the idea of becoming a curator over content and, and that, that's extending the, the, the definition of, of what journalism it means sure did, yeah. for the National Association of Black Journalists. The interviewer seems pretty content with the interview here, which is a bit odd considering he's pleasantly contemplating what perspective on the extended definition of what journalism means for critical race theorists, and of course realizing his own diversion and inclusivity and completely unaware of the subject matter she was talking about. A very pleasant, informative conversation with an individual who's putting critical race theory in practice every single day. Yes. Sharon Tumer, thank you so much for sharing the work of the National Association of Black Journalists, and thank you so much for your insight. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.
Now, an interesting point here is that this interview was released on YouTube on June 20th, 2018. On Friday of the same week, June 22nd, 2018, Sharon Toomer resigns as executive director of the NABJ. I'm not jumping to any conclusion, but simply noting the timing does stand out. But more interesting than that is this. This article was written in 2016, specifically calling out many of these issues. While it defends the good works of the NABJ, it's clearly highlighting a multitude of faults that have created a situation that's got the author calling for a beginning to the process of getting the entire house in order of the organization. I think it would be sufficient to say that the house has not gotten itself in order since then. Rather, it's continued in the direction of disorder by actively promoting critical race theory into newsrooms and media companies alike, helping heighten polarization at an astonishing rate. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a comment or share the video, and thank you for watching.